Hi, this is John Romano, and I'm recording this lecture from our course on World Civilization to 1500. And this is, lecture is Imperial China, the Sui, Tang, and Song Dynasty, uh, which follows from our discussion, our previous discussion, of Imperial China. We had said, in spite of the strength of the first two dynasties, in particular the Han Dynasty, uh, that in effect, eventually, the Han Dynasty would unravel. And during the centuries that followed the Han Dynasty, what we see, rather than just one strong imperial family, are uh, several different regional kingdoms, uh, that all of which make bids to try to assert authority over all China. Uh, but none of these, in fact, have possessed enough resources uh, to do so. Finally, however, in the late 6th century, uh, we're going to see a change, and in effect, we're going to see a new dynasty, uh, which we know as the Sui dynasty, that is going to take charge of China. Uh, and uh, this new uh, dynasty uh, is not going to live for a huge amount of time. In fact, uh, the, the Sui dynasty uh, will only last for approximately 30 years. Uh, but uh, similar to the way that the Qin dynasty uh, prepared China for the Han dynasty, uh, some people would say that the reimposition of imperial rule uh, that the Sui brought about would, in effect, uh, allow the Tang dynasty uh, to rule for a much longer period. And on the whole, many would, people would say, uh, that uh, these three imperial dynasties we're talking about today, the Sui, the Tang, and the Song, uh, would organize Chinese society so effectively uh, that China would become a center of exceptional agricultural and industrial production. And uh, the effects of this uh, would, in time, be felt throughout uh, the entire East. Now to start then with the Sui dynasty. Uh, this here is an image of Sui Wendi an ambitious ruler in North China who would embark on a series of military campaigns uh, that would, again, as we've seen before in uh, uh, the, this very typical pattern of the dynastic cycle, uh, he would militarily centralize imperial rule under himself. It is uh, fair to say before that Sui Wendi was in a position to do this, however, he first had to impose tight political discipline on his own northern state, uh, and only then extend his rule to the rest of China. Interestingly enough, uh, he uh, rose to power initially uh, when um, the uh, a Turkish, a foreign ruler uh, who is powerful in this region of China, uh, decided to appoint him uh, as uh, as duke. And I just may show you how little control China had over uh, its own areas and that there was a, a foreign in charge of this region at the time. Uh, at some point, uh, the, this uh, foreign patron ended up dying, uh, which would leave his young son in power. And uh, it was his intention that the, his child, his seven-year-old boy, uh, would then become ruler. Uh, but Sui Wendi, we think, had other plans, and uh, he would end up forcing the young boy uh, to abdicate one year later, uh, and then he ended up claiming the throne. And uh, as we've seen before, uh, Chinese rulers had a built-in justification uh, when things of this nature happened. They could simply say, as people now have been saying for quite some time, uh, that the mandate of heaven had changed, uh, and now the mandate of heaven had ended up smiling on this new ruler, on Sui Wendi. Um, soon after getting into power, uh, we see that uh, Sui Wendi has to actually put into, uh, into effect his plan to rule all of China, and so he actually begins to send out a series of military expeditions um, into uh, uh, other areas, uh, Chinese-speaking areas. And by the year 589, he would rule all of China. We, uh, in addition to the fact that uh, the uh, Sui dynasty uh, would act like the Qin 
uh, in revi really bringing forth an imperial system and helping pave the way for the next dynasty, there's another similarity. We also see that uh, the rulers under the Sui dynasty would place enormous demands on their subjects. Um, part of uh, a part of their attitude uh, was that if you are going to have an, an empire, you are going to take advantage of its plenty. Um, and so uh, they forced uh, many peasants to work for them, uh, ordering, for instance, the construction of palaces. Uh, and this is just one piece of the palace from this period of time. Uh, they ordered peasants to build granaries for them. Uh, they ordered repairs on the defensive walls, as we referred to earlier, the, the Great Wall of China. And we also see them dispatching military forces both to Central Asia and Korea. Um, on top of these things, they would levy high taxes on their subjects. By far the most elaborate project uh, that was carried out during uh, the reign of the Sui was known as the Grand Canal. Uh, and uh, this, uh, you should distinguish this from the Grand Canal of Venice. Uh, and uh, this, in fact, is a much earlier project. The, the Grand Canal uh, ended up being one of the world's largest waterworks projects, and uh, really, in some ways, an extremely impressive uh, accomplishment. The, uh, and uh, you can see here um, on, on this map, you have some idea of where the, uh, uh, where the Grand Canal goes. Um, when it was built as a whole, we can see that uh, it was extremely useful to be able to facilitate trade uh, between the northern part of China and the southern part. Uh, and uh, in fact, this allowed different areas of China to specialize in specific crops. Uh, know it with the knowledge that, for instance, you could carry rice uh, from the south to the north uh, and other kinds of food. And in fact, by water, this was a manageable uh, way to transport things uh, and people as well. Um, one of the benefits we think uh, that uh, uh, the Grand Canal had was that people could much more easily get their goods and themselves around China. Uh, to give you some idea of what portions of the Grand Canal look like today, uh, I show you uh, this picture here uh, and this one here. Uh, it's fair to say that uh, in the intervening centuries, the Grand Canal has been widened even further. When completed, the Grand Canal extended almost uh, 1,200 miles, uh, and reportedly um, it was 40 paces wide, which is to say uh, that uh, supposedly a boat could be going both to the north and another could be going to the south, and they could uh, they could pass by one another uh, without interruption. And uh, roads uh, were built uh, parallel to either side of the Grand Canal. We we think that um, the largest effect was then to integrate the economy of northern and southern China. Uh, and uh, we think, too, that just by integrating the economy, uh, we think that uh, both uh, politically speaking and culturally speaking, uh, China would end up much more unified after the Grand Canal had been built. Especially when it came to the Grand Canal, uh, one could argue, looking back, that this construction project served China quite well. Uh, but at the time, the, its building would generate considerably ho considerable hostility. And uh, this, uh, this really has to do, again, with the fact that most of this labor was forced, uh, which meant that no one was happy to do it in the first place. Uh, in addition to this, uh, the Sui dynasty would experience military setbacks in Korea. And uh, if you're going to be a dictatorial militaristic government, at very least, you want it to be a successful dictatorial militaristic government. What all of this meant was it uh, prompted discontent among subjects uh, against the Sui dynasty, uh, which would really severely weaken its hold on the country. And finally, in the year 618, 
uh, disgruntled minister who had once actually served the Sui dynasty would assassinate the emperor and really bring this dynasty to a quick end. After the end of the Sui dynasty then, soon a rebel leader would seize the capital city and then proclaim himself the emperor of a new dynasty, uh, which was named the Tang dynasty uh, after the hereditary title uh, that he had. And the Tang dynasty, at least in terms of years, is, and uh, really uh, by many other measures, is going to be much more successful than the Sui dynasty. Uh, and in fact, the Tang dynasty would survive for almost 300 years. Many people would say as well, it would end up organizing China into a powerful, productive, and prosperous society. Much of uh, the success of the Tang dynasty uh, was due to this man pictured here, known as Tang Taitsung. Tang Taitsung was a, a person both ambitious and, some would say, ruthless. To get the throne initially, Tang Taitsung would end up murdering his own two brothers uh, and pushed his father aside. Uh, but uh, once he got to the throne, um, really must have been to the amazement of everyone, he actually displays a very high sense of duty. Uh, and uh, we think to some degree Tang Taitsun seems to believe that uh, he had to provide for the people an effective and stable government. Uh, if only to be able to stay in power, uh, but perhaps there was some sense of duty wrapped up with that as well. Uh, we know uh, that Tang Taitsung uh, would certainly do building projects as well uh, within the capital. Uh, this building looming in the background uh, is one of them. But um, in addition to those uh, kind of projects that one always did as part of an imperial government, we do see that Tang Taitsung heeds his subjects' interest, interests. One of the things, for instance, that we know had been a real problem before he came to power was banditry. Uh, there were robbers uh, who were running around. Uh, and uh, Tang Taitsung uses imperial power then to just begin to, uh, to kill off robbers, uh, making the roads much safer and making people really feel the effects of what it meant to have an effective government in place. Tang Taitsung was also smart enough to keep the price of rice low during his reign, uh, artificially low, really, uh, to be able uh, to keep peasants happy. We also see that Tang Taitsung always keeps uh, taxes relatively low. He certainly, especially for those in the lower class. Um, the last thing he wants is a huge rebellion on his hands and no one ever likes to pay taxes. Altogether, what this means is that uh, under the Tang Dynasty, China would enjoy unusual stability and prosperity. Even apart from Tang Taitsung, uh, historians would say that in general, there are three policies that help explain the success of the Tang. The first of these is that the Tang Dynasty would maintain very well articulated, uh, uh, well articulated uh, transportation and communications network, um, making sure that people, in essence, and the military could travel uh, throughout this in this empire. Uh, so uh, they continue, for instance, to take care of the Grand Canal. Um, the, the many people may not have been happy with how the Grand Canal came into being initially, but now that it existed, uh, it was important to make sure it was kept up well. We also see uh, that uh, roads were very well maintained under the Tang Dynasty. We see that um, in addition to just allowing normal people to be able to travel, which was one of the benefits of having these roads, uh, we also see 
uh, that the government creates something like the Pony Express. Uh, they have special uh, inns uh, and postal stations uh, that are intended uh, for government employees. Uh, so uh, especially when they were uh, delivering messages or on official business. Uh, and uh, what, uh, what these government officials could do was rest at these inns. Uh, they could get food. Uh, they could switch out to get a better horse. Uh, and so this uh, really helped to tie together uh, the empire very well. It was said even that uh, one could deliver seafood all the way from the coast uh, into the deep interior regions of China uh, in a few days. I mean, heaven knows what it tastes like once it got there, but uh, one could do it. We also see that the Tang Dynasty begins to experiment uh, with a new form of distribution of land uh, that is known as the equal field system. Uh, a system that was intended to govern how agricultural land was handed out to people. And uh, the, the basic idea, uh, which you can hear from the name, is that they wanted to attempt to have an equitable distribution of land. Um, that really, in some ways, was um, was based upon how much land did either an individual or a family need? Uh, how much would they reasonably be able uh, to work? Uh, and uh, what what uh, what ends up happening then is that the government, the Chinese government, has the power then uh, to be able uh, to distribute land. And it, it does not want to allow people to simply be able to take land into the hereditary possession of their family and for the government to never see it again. So um, you can only actually give down uh, to people in your family one-fifth of your land. And then the rest it really goes back, it reverts to the government, and then they can decide at that point what are the needs of uh, those people in your family who you're giving the land to? How much uh, land did, should they get? Uh, should they give redistribute land to other peoples as well? The third policy that explains the success of the Tang is their reliance on a bureaucracy that was based upon merit. And uh, they're very serious that the people who work for the government, these civil servants, uh, have to be skilled individuals. Uh, and, but it was not enough to take their word for it. Uh, and uh, what we see now uh, is that they, there is a creation of what is known as an examination system. Uh, and it was this uh, exam that would determine if people were allowed uh, to work for the government civil service, and if so, what job they would get. What you had to do to be able to uh, study for this exam was to master some of the classic works of Chinese literature and philosophy, uh, some of which you've read for this class. Uh, think, for instance, uh, of the works of Confucius, uh, or, or some of the texts that people had to learn. It was not enough however, to simply learn these texts and get the gist of them, uh, have be able to paraphrase what these works said. Uh, in fact, for the examination system, you would have to memorize these texts. You have to be able to reproduce them verbatim solely from memory. Uh, and uh, what that meant was, in essence, is that people had to study for the exam system for years and years uh, to be able to pass it, if they could pass it at all. Now, some people might complain that uh, did this system really just produce a, a, a series of uh, uh, of really just robots who could uh, who could give all these texts from memory? And uh, there is something to be said for the fact that uh, it was not a, a test that really uh, uh, really at all examined. 
uh, your creative thinking or your ability to use said texts in practical situations. With that being said, though, um, this was a text test that um, really did measure how hardworking individuals were. And that, in fact, most office holders would end up winning their positions because of their intellectual ability. Uh, and uh, what this means is if you really did get through all of this hard work um, and, and get this post, you really treasured it. Uh, and you were someone who then could turn uh, that same sort of sense of consistent hard work and use it for the interests of the state. Some people would say that um, all of these policies of the Tang were not entirely original. They had, uh, they had been seen previously to some degree. Uh, but the Tang dynasty, more so than any other dynasty, applies them systematically and effectively um, to good effect. Another thing that really characterizes the Tang dynasty is war. And in fact, even soon after its foundations, uh, the Tang state would flex its muscles and brought, uh, really, by means of war, bring all kinds of new territories in uh, to their empire. And if you look at this map in particular, uh, what you'll see is that China extends itself both into the north, and a lot of this territory in the west really had previously not been Chinese territory at all. Uh, we also see uh, that China will conquer the northern part of Vietnam. Uh, altogether, what this meant was that China had become an absolutely enormous empire, even larger than it had been previous to this point. China, though, did not simply uh, directly conquer territory. It also forced other neighboring powers to recognize them as their overlord, uh, as a superior power to them. Uh, and uh, really, China begins for the first time to refer to itself as the Middle Kingdom. Quite literally, they viewed themselves as the center of the world, and everyone was lesser than them. Uh, and. Uh, all of these realms around these were viewed as subordinate, and they had to show how lesser, uh, how much lesser they were uh, than China. And so some of these subordinate powers would, for instance, be uh, Korea, um, the southern part of Vietnam. And what people from these smaller and less powerful states would have to do, as you can see illustrated here, uh, is send diplomats uh, to China. And in their hands normally would be gifts. Um, when they got in front of the Chinese emperor, then they would have to ritually prostrate themselves. Uh, first of all, just kneeling themselves, kneeling before the emperor, and then actually touching their forehead to the ground, uh, something that is known as the kowtow. Now, you might think to yourself that uh, giving these gifts was an economic loss uh, for these smaller powers. Uh, but in fact, the, uh, the Chinese emperor, upon receiving uh, the gifts of these uh, embassies, would then turn around and give far more lavish gifts in return. This was not at all an economic exchange. Uh, in fact, it was meant to show just how rich the Chinese emperor was, that he could provide even more lavish gifts uh, than anybody else. In the process, too, the Chinese emperor, again, the head of this middle kingdom, uh, would then confirm the authority uh, of any of these subordinate realms who came to him. I should say, too, that some of these interactions of uh, these embassies traveling to China probably also have a much broader kind of meaning uh, in that uh, these, uh, these diplomats would learn quite a bit about China, uh, and uh, uh, they sometimes would also uh, bring that kind of cultural information back. And uh, these embassies would also at times help to uh, sponsor trade or trade relationships being struck up. 
So they were useful from that perspective as well. We think that under certain able rulers like Taitung Tatsung, uh, the, uh, the Tang dynasty uh, would flourish. Uh, but during the mid 8th century, uh, this dynasty would end up uh, entering into a crisis from which it would never fully recover. And at least some scholars feel that the Tang dynasty uh, really had been too successful for its own good. And some of the later emperors uh, were quite, quite careless in the way that they ruled over China. Uh, they allowed uh, China to be, begin to spiral out of control. Rumors began to circulate, in effect, uh, that later emperors of the Tang dynasty entirely neglected public affairs, uh, that they were spending time with their concubines, listening to music, going to parties, uh, but they were doing very little uh, to actually look out for the common good. And uh, we see this, and uh, we see that uh, some of uh, the generals uh, use this situation uh, to begin to gain independent authority for themselves. Uh, and in fact, there was a short-lived rebellion uh, where one general would actually seize the capital city, uh, but uh, this, uh, this came to a quick close when one of his soldiers would end up murdering this general. After this point, though, uh, we really think uh, that the Tang state becomes weaker and weaker and because now of this distrust that later Tang emperors would have of their own military, uh, they ended up actually, uh, believe it or not, inviting a foreign Turkish army into China uh, to be able to actually act as a counterweight against their own, uh, their own army, believe it or not. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the results, however, um, were, uh, were really predictable. And uh, these fires, in fact, would end up actually coming to China and themselves robbing many places. Uh, and this uh, crisis was so badly handled uh, that later Tug, these later Tug emperors would never regain their authority. On top of this, we think that uh, one of the signature programs of the Tang dynasty, the equal field system, in later years would become corrupt and uh, larger landholders would end up uh, monopolizing a lot of the land. And uh, what ended up happening as a result of this, too, is that there were fewer taxes going to the government. On top of these other problems, uh, we see increasingly Turkish peoples beginning to encroach in imperial land, uh, especially in the north. Under these unsettled circumstances, uh, we see in the ninth century what we have seen before in China when peasants were, are extremely unhappy about the shape of government. Uh, they begin to rebel against it. Uh, and uh, we even see at one point um, one general actually taking advantage of this kind of peasant discontent and becoming something of a Robin Hood. Uh, he would actually end up pillaging the wealthy and distributing uh, a portion of his plunder among the poor. Uh, increasingly, in desperation, the last Tang rulers would begin to give power out to regional military commanders who really gain so much power at the local level that they become the effective rulers. And uh, finally, in the year 907, uh, the last Tang ruler would abdicate, bringing an end to this dynasty. This brings me to the, the last of the three dynasties we'll discuss, known as the Song Dynasty. For a period of time, these regional military commanders started to act as warlords in China, until finally the Song Dynasty would once again be able to reimpose imperial rule at the end of the 10th century. On paper, you might think that the Song dynasty uh, had uh, just as much power as the previous two dynasties we've seen today, uh, and they do rule for over three centuries. But uh, by the same measure, most people would tend to think that they never built a very powerful state. Likely because 
of what had happened toward the end of the Tang Dynasty, where the military gained such a tremendous amount of power, in fact, more power uh, than the emperor toward the end. We think that there is this systematic skepticism and distrust uh, of the military in the Song Dynasty, Song Dynasty. And uh, the emperors of this dynasty would pl place far more emphasis on, for instance, civil administration, uh, industry, education, and the arts. Uh, and uh, that certainly applies um, to this man here, uh, Sung Tai Tzu, who is the first emperor of this dynasty and who set in many of its policies. Um, and uh, we see that uh, Tang, Sung Tai Tzu would begin his career as a junior military officer of just one powerful warlord in northern China. Uh, and but in his service in this role, he would gain this reputation for honesty and effectiveness. Um, at a certain point, his own troops proclaimed him as emperor. And then he and his army went about the business of making uh, that true, making him an actual emperor. And they subjected the many warlords uh, on China at the time to his authority and consolidated the control of the Su. Um, at this point, they would set about organizing the state uh, under, uh, under central administration, and they would put military forces under a very tight supervision. Uh, and uh, we, again, this is not necessarily a bad state of affairs, uh, that the military was not receiving as much attention or funding in the past. And uh, one of the things that, for instance, people who study China, uh, one of the reasons they love the Song Dynasty is the amount of art that is produced during it. So we see, for instance, uh, here's just some of uh, the, the painting that was produced. Calligraphy becomes a major art uh, at this period. We have plenty of that preserved from the Song Dynasty. Uh, here's just uh, one painting from the Song Dynasty that uh, apparently shows uh, this uh, this poet who uh, just has become so enraptured that he doesn't even realize his own clothing is falling down. Um, there's work on the loom, uh, again one of the forms of artwork under the Song Dynasty. Uh, again, a painting of a rabbit. Uh, children and a uh, a kitten statues uh, again all of this uh, is very exciting material to work with for those people uh, especially who study artwork during this, this period um, the Song dynasty uh, also tried to learn uh, from some of the mistakes of the past uh, by trying to make sure that they had a uh, a bureaucracy uh, that uh, really viewed itself as being extremely loyal to the imperial government, to the emperor. And uh, in effect, in exchange for the loyalty they have, they would reward these, uh, these civil servants extremely well. And in fact, uh, they actually end up expanding bureaucracy with the idea uh, that the more people who had contact with the government in this very positive way, uh, would tend to support its policies. This ended up leading to an entirely an, an unanticipated problem in that uh, the Song Dynasty would spend so much m money on civil service uh, that it would end up completely devouring the surplus production of the state. So they, they went broke, in essence, in order to be able to fund this government. When they abruptly attempted to uh, to change course and then to raise taxes, uh, they uh, they ended up aggravating the peasants who, uh, as we've seen before, uh, did not want to pay a huge amount of taxes. And then this ends up leading to more peasant revolts. Perhaps slightly more predictably, too, the Song Dynasty in time is going to run into significant problems with its own military. Uh, one of um, the quirks of uh, the Song Dynasty uh, was that um, 
the people who ended up leading its armies, its generals, were scholars, uh, people who had, had not worked their way up through the ranks uh, in the way one does in the U.S. military, uh, but people who had really learned all sorts of book knowledge, as other uh, bureaucrats had. Uh, and uh, then all of a sudden they were sent out into the field to try to lead armies based upon this theoretical knowledge. Uh, and uh, the results really were somewhat predictable and extremely negative when they were forced into the situation. Uh, I should say, by the way, this is something that actually is uh, was true of uh, the British uh, army under the empire as well, uh, that people uh, really would start off as scholars and end up becoming a part of the army. Uh, some people would say then that uh, really it should come as no surprise to anyone uh, that based upon this series of generals, there is very little to check the kind of nomadic peoples who flourished in the northern border of China. Uh, and uh, simply because those who responded to these uh, nomads uh, did such a poor job of checking them. What this meant is that um, the Song dynasty uh, suffered raid after raid against northern Chinese populations. And some of these nomadic groups uh, were so successful in battle that they could demand tribute from areas in China. And uh, the, this, uh, at some point, this was merely an annoyance, uh, but in time, nomads would actually end up becoming a, a, an existential threat uh, to the Sioux. And uh, we'll discuss more in the next lecture how the Sioux dynasty would in time lose uh, power entirely to the Mongols, who uh, had started off as another nomadic group, but unlike some of the nomadic groups in the past, uh, they eventually conquered so much that they were there to stay. Lest I, I leave off on the most negative uh, points uh, about uh, these imperial dynasties, however, um, one really has to, to uh, stop for a moment and speak a little bit about the kind of economic development that occurred, uh, especially under the Tang and Song dynasties. And whatever you want to say about the eventual political and military problems they had, uh, if you look uh, across uh, the course of these, uh, these two dynasties, uh, you really find in China this remarkable economic surge. Uh, and uh, this would have huge implications both for China and for those other territories that were around it. Uh, so what kinds of economic development was there? Well, first of all, there was agricultural development. Uh, the Chinese discovered a fast ripening form of rice uh, that allowed them to, uh, to be able to plant and harvest two crops per year. Uh, as part of this agricultural uh, uh, innovation, uh, the Chinese also learned better techniques of farming. Um, they used, for instance, heavy iron plows, uh, they used oxen and water buffaloes, and uh, their irrigation systems became uh, even more advanced during this period. Food, as we've seen before, a greater amount of food is going to lead to more people. And indeed, in China, the population begins to expand, and expand largely in the countryside, but also now uh, increasingly in cities. Um, and uh, under the Tang, the capital city, uh, known as Shang'an, and you can see uh, one sort of image of this city here, uh, this city becomes enormous. Uh, it ends up actually having uh, 2 million residents, for a pre which for a pre-modern city is huge. Uh, and um, in addition to just having cities, uh, we really see uh, all of the things that you may associate with urban life. Uh, so think of restaurants and bars, uh, places where people could go hear music, theaters, large markets with things from all over the place. Um, and uh, really with the, all of this kind of better production, uh, China had far more to export uh, to different regions. Uh, so th this means that um, that process of specializing in specific crops, 
um, it actually becomes even more uh, progressed in China. You knew that uh, you could grow one crop in a particular area, uh, and then you could simply move it around by means of roads, by means of the Grand Canal, for instance. We also see uh, new technological and industrial uh, development in China. Um, now, we've seen before that um, uh, once you have abundant food, enough people to be able to grow it, uh, this allows you to free up people who previously would have worked on the land, and they could begin to pursue new technologies. So, for instance, uh, we see in this period the production of high-quality porcelain, uh, and uh, this is going to become an item uh, that was highly sought after. The Chinese also begin to improve their use of metal, the creation of metal, as you can see uh, to some degree in these schematics. Uh, the metal they produce uh, becomes stronger and more useful. Um, and uh, in fact, we saw increased use of both iron and steel. And uh, these uh, will lead to having uh, even more uh, effective tools, metal tools, than they had previously. Uh, in part uh, to be able to plant and harvest, but also for war. The Chinese also create entirely new products during this period. Uh, so, for instance, the first creation of gunpowder uh, comes, uh, in fact, for the entire world, comes uh, in China. Uh, the, the earliest forms of gunpowder were, were primitive. In fact, they were a little more initially than uh, firecrackers, uh, but um, once they had been created, uh, they could be gradually refined uh, and then, of course, uh, used uh, similar to uh, gunpowder today. Uh, perhaps even uh, more important on the long haul was the creation in China in this period of printing. Uh, and uh, this, of course, is the first creation of, of printing anywhere. And uh, what we'll see in China uh, is a very specific kind uh, of printing known as woodblock printing. And uh, this is very distinct from what we'll see later on in the West, uh, uh, something known as movable type, where you're able to put in individual letters because the number of letters in most Western languages is small enough that it's fairly easy then uh, to be able to uh, uh, to plug in individual letters into a printing press. Uh, not so with uh, Chinese, which has uh, a much larger number of characters. Uh, and so what you would then do uh, if uh, you wanted to be able to uh, get, uh, to be able to print a text was that uh, you would take a block of wood, you would carve it in reverse with whatever characters you wanted, and you could also, as you see here, uh, you could add any kind of images you wanted. Then, uh, with that uh, piece of wood that was carved in reverse, you could put ink on it, and then you could press down on paper. Using this method, text could be produced quickly, cheaply, and in huge quantities. Uh, and uh, in fact, what it meant was for many of those people, for instance, who were studying for the examination system, uh, it even allowed students to be able to have their own copy of some of these texts that they were studying and memorizing. The Chinese in this period would all also develop the compass, uh, which of course tells you which direction you're traveling in. And uh, this was most helpful at sea with navigation at sea, uh, especially if you are uh, going into the open seas where you can't see land. Uh, if you do not have uh, the compass, you'll simply have no idea what direction you're headed in. Altogether, most people would tend to say uh, that in China, you really see a highly developed market economy beginning to grow up. Um, and uh, with all of these items that we've been discussing, uh, with the surplus of agriculture, uh, these new kind of manufactured goods like uh, 
uh, like, for instance, uh, porcelain. Uh, and the ones we've discussed previously, like, for instance, silk. This allowed the Chinese, first of all, to put some of these wares on the open market on a domestic level, so within China, but also a very healthy foreign trade uh, begins to strike up. And in fact, uh, there is so much trade uh, in China uh, that uh, it was really clear to everyone uh, that there were not enough coins to be able to handle the volume of trading. And so this uh, leads uh, China in the late 9th century to the first experiments with paper money. Uh, and, uh, the, of course, which are guaranteed by the government, the, the value of this money. Um, I should say, uh, of course, that along with the creation of paper money, uh, very soon after you will also see the creation of counterfeiting of paper money. Uh, and, uh, and, in fact, the government will start to monopolize the creation of all money uh, to make sure uh, that this kind of counterfeiting does not go on. The end result of this is as a result of all of this new production of materials, of new trade, of new urbanization. China will, during this period of time, become a prosperous and cosmopolitan society. And uh, it wasn't just a matter of Chinese merchants going to other places to bring back uh, to trade or to bring back goods. Uh, all kinds of foreigners uh, begin to come to China during this period by land and sea. And in fact, they become accustomed to seeing foreign merchants. Uh, this statue actually shows you just one image uh, of how at least one Chinese person saw uh, one of these foreigners who came into China. Uh, entire communities in some uh, big uh, Chinese port cities uh, were filled with foreign merchants. Uh, so they had a presence there uh, then to be able to make this trading easier. Uh, and uh, we think as a result of both um, Chinese merchants going out and coming back to China uh, and uh, then these, uh, these foreigners in their midst, uh, we also see Chinese consumers developing a taste for exotic goods. And uh, this really uh, has a ripple effect on stimulating trade throughout the East. Uh, and so, uh, in many cases, um, you see these huge emporia beginning to grow up in China. Uh, that uh, you really could purchase near uh, all of the sort of luxury items uh, of the world. Uh, so think of, for instance, uh, spices, uh, pearls, incense, horses. Uh, all of these things uh, could be located uh, in China. And altogether, uh, we see this sort of Chinese economic surge uh, during the height of the Tang and the Su, and uh, really, uh, which will lead to all kinds of Chinese uh, goods uh, really being disseminated far beyond the borders of China. Uh, and uh, so at least some people would say uh, that this is uh, at least one of the golden ages uh, in China's long history, uh, even uh, if its ripple effects were largely felt in East Asia, not necessarily throughout the entire world. Uh, and uh, we, we, uh, it was obvious really to everyone at this time that uh, Chinese civilization had already reached quite a mature form uh, during this period of time. Uh, and uh, it is said uh, that many of the foreign visitors who came were absolutely in awe at the wonder uh, that China had to offer at this time. All right. Thank you.